Uh, sorry for the delay. As I was just uh, mentioning to some people up here, I feel very strange um, because I just came from a midterm, like proctoring a midterm, so I didn't just teach for like 15 minutes, so I feel kind of rusty right now. Usually you get like a nice warmed up professor who's like ready to go. So I've been doing this for 15 minutes. Um, great. So uh, before we get back into TCP, anybody have questions? Yes. What was the secret test of part two? What's the secret test of part three? Which one? There's two. There were two, yes. Um, okay, so maybe I should stop the recording. So if I reuse this assignment. Um, so the second, so the first secret test was testing uh, URL encoding. So are you properly URL decoding the URL? Not to execute the command, right? But anything in the URL can be URL encoded, right? Including the exec, right? And it means the same thing because it's just encoding. So you have to decode that before you test it. just doing a pipe. So it was doing this exact same thing as one of the other tests, but it was calling, I think, ls something, I think slash etc, and then piping that through some other program, like tr, to translate spaces to underscores, and then comparing that with that same command being executed. Uh, so if you weren't handling pipes correctly, you would fail that. Any other questions? Was it fun? Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't have the graphs, but like the number of submissions, at least like two hours before, shot up to like 36 in the queue, and that held kind of steady, so that's why it took so long for the results. Um, I have ideas of how to speed up the submission system, but I obviously wasn't going to implement that right two hours before the deadline, so uh, I did not do that, but I think in the future I'll try to, it's a trade-off, because I had ways to make it faster, but then that caused it to be more unreliable, which is not good for you guys anyways. Because uh, you want to know that it actually passes and it's going to pass the exact same way every time. So, yeah. What, en what ended up being the average? I have no idea. I haven't looked at all. Oh, okay. yeah. A number. <laughs> uh, I looked through them. They looked, of the submissions, they looked pretty good. There weren't a ton of incredibly low scores, so that's good. <coughs> yeah, in the back. Uh, you want another one? You're just a glutton for fun. <laughs> uh, oh, the projects? Uh, that'll be, we'll do it about halfway through the course. I think we're still got about two or three weeks to go before we hit like halfway point. Something after the break? Yeah, that's probably a good, good idea. Yeah, I'm thinking like after break we'll, we'll start to talk about projects. But at this point, it's a little premature because we've only covered like a third of <coughs> the stuff I want to cover, right? How many assignments would be there? Like there would be five assignments or? Whatever the syllabus says. Hmm? Whatever the syllabus says. Yeah. No, that's my answer. It's whatever the syllabus says. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Class questions? Project questions? Any other questions? Yeah. You're releasing, aside from me, you're releasing your report today, the next one. Who said that? Uh, no one. Uh, no, the homework will be released when it's released. I want to give you a little bit of a break. So probably Friday, maybe Wednesday. I mean, Monday, sorry, probably Monday, maybe Wednesday. Uh, we'll see. Do you want to, like, take a breath? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Wednesday would be good? I uh, will see. Any other questions? So maybe the TA should not give out dates of assignments when they're not due yet. <laughs> All right. All right, so just to clarify and go back to where we were, right? So we're talking about TCP and we're talking about how does TCP work? How does it specify all the segments? Uh, we had some confusion and I say we, I really just mean me. Um, 
and probably also you as well because of that. Um, so the idea was looking at, we looked at this when data is being exchanged, right? So here, in this packet, the client is sending the server 25 bytes of data, right? And the sequence number is 6575. So I re-looked at the spec to clarify in my mind. So yes, the way we eventually got to it is correct. So the sequence number says, okay, at byte 6575, that's the first byte of this packet, right? And the next 24 bytes all go in there. Um, so that when it acts, the act is always the next thing that it's expecting. Right? So it's going to be, and it's the problem of the, like I was trying to, trying to come up with a good way to explain it. I just had to draw it out and look at like, okay, if I sent four bytes and the first byte is at uh, 6575, then the next byte is at 6576, the third byte is at 6577, and the fourth byte is at 6578, which means that I'm expecting 6579, which would be this sequence number plus the four bytes that I sent. So that's how we got there. So that's all good. Any questions on that? So this is why the act is essentially the sequence number plus the size. Cool. All right. So we looked at data being exchanged, and we looked at it at the packet level, right? So we saw that the connection here is uh, pushing data, and we have our acts back and forth. Uh, somebody's going to have to remind me, do we go through these? We did? Okay. Cool. All right. So we can see that uh, we have packets being sent. Um, and we can see here TCP dump is actually doing some nice stuff for us. It's showing us that, hey, up here, um, this 12 is the size of the TCP packet. So it's showing, hey, this is the sequence number that's being sent. Um, and it's from this to this, right? So it's doing that. Uh, to the end there, and so that we, we can see the acknowledgement is correct uh, here in the acknowledgement of that packet. Uh, if you're going to do this in TCP dump, you want to do the, there's a flag to do absolute offset, so you can see the actual value that it's being output, otherwise it will actually take the initial sequence number as essentially zero and show you offsets from that. So now we know how to talk, so we know how to connect. So how do we connect? Using TCP, how does it work? Then, then act, act. Yeah, three-way handshake. That's something you should like tattoo on your arm. Or maybe not on your arm, maybe like on a part that's not so conspicuous. Um, or just memorize, that's another good way. Because um, it's something that's really important, right? This is the protocol that underlines all of our crazy internet traffic, right? Um, okay, so we know that, and then we know how we can actually get data across, right? And we use these sequence numbers so that we know when we get multiple data, and we know that we actually received the data, and we get confirmation that that data got there. Uh, so now we actually have this reliable mechanism. Uh, but basically, now we need some way to, to shut up, right? And be like, okay, let's stop, let's stop talking. Like, how do we do that? Um, so. This is the shutdown procedure. So basically, either, either partner, A or B, can terminate its stream by sending a packet with a fin flag set. So what is, why does it mean one of the partners? Shouldn't it be like the client or the server who decides? What's that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter? What do you mean it doesn't matter? Because the server can just say, oh, I don't want to send it. Right, so TCP is a full duplex, right? So both sides can communicate or send data either way. So this is a way for one side to say, hey, I'm done sending data to you, right? Um, and so the other partner, B, answers with an act, acts that fin. And this means now A will not send any more data to B, right? Uh, it will only acknowledge the data that B sends, right? So you have this one way only one way data stream open. Uh, and then finally, when B decides it's done, it can decide to shut down the stream by doing the same thing, sending a thin packet, receiving an acknowledgment, and then they're done. They know they're done talking. Cool. So the way this looks, 
So if the client wants to terminate the connection to the server, it's going to send a packet here with uh, an ACK and the fin flag set. So that's how you know it's a terminating packet, the fin one there. Uh, now comes a very interesting thing where the server acknowledges this. So how does it, so this is something that I had to also revisit so we didn't have a repeat uh, Wednesday. Um, and looking at what's, so what's the data of this fin packet that the client sends? How, how much data is there in this example? Zero, yeah, there's nothing in there, right? So the sequence number is 6983. Right, so acknowledgement numbers, what are we normally acknowledging? The next expected byte, right? So, but we haven't sent any data here, right? But when we reply back, when the server replies back, it acts uh, acknowledgement number that's one greater than the sequence number that the server sent us. So why does it do this? Because fin is set? <coughs> yes, but why? After look at it, it tells you that's what it does, but why does it do that? It's a counter for the packages to go like outside the network and coming. So it but it seems counterintuitive, right? Because the sequence number, uh, acknowledging a greater sequence, uh, acknowledging a higher byte, right, than what you actually got, because we didn't actually receive any bytes for 6983. It might be, yeah. Counting the counter for the headers too? Uh, nope. We have a separate count for headers somewhere else in here, which we're not showing. It's already right? acknowledged. It's already acknowledged. Last time. It's already six nine eight three. Um. Yeah, the number of the last packet. So think about this way: How does the client know that the server got the fin packet? If I just sent it back a packet with, yeah, exactly. So it knows that the other side received that fin packet if it gets back an acknowledgement with that additional, uh, the increment of the acknowledgement number. So it's not that we actually sent, because it seems very strange, because we didn't send any bytes, so we shouldn't be incrementing the acknowledgement number. But specifically in this case with the fin, and normally I would probably not go into this much detail, but I've made a big deal about it, so now I'm going to continue to do that. <laughs> Even in this sin, uh, we return with one plus, right? So Only with data, though. Only with data. Like, look at this packet, right? So this is acknowledging 6777, right, the other way. And then we're sending a sequence of 6777, right? So that doesn't change because no data has been exchanged, right? The sequence and acknowledgement number should only change if we actually are sending data, right? But that's what tripped me up just because I was looking at this. So then finally, uh, so we can actually, uh, so now the fin came from the client, right? So that means the client's not gonna send the server any more data, but the server can also send the client data, right? So it's gonna send, uh, uh, or that's not any data. Oh, it sent data here, right? So the server can send 30 bytes here. So the server, let's see, mm, I should probably stop doing this math. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop. Okay. Uh, so then it can send a fin packet, right? So it sends data, then sends the fin packet. And now once the client has acknowledged that, it can acknowledge, uh, let's see, up to 698808, uh, which means that it received the fin packet and, and all the data that was sent. Right, so now both sides know we've properly closed our connection. Both sides know that we've closed our connection and we can go about our business. Questions on this? Yeah. Why does the first packet from server to the client send 30 bytes of data? Just because it's an example. It doesn't oh, have to. No, no, it's just, yeah. Just a specific example. Oh. Yeah. So just to clarify, when you send the fin, you're signifying that you're closing your pen. You're done talking. Talk. You're never going to send any more data. Yeah, okay. So whoever sent it is no longer going to send any data. So what happens if we send data on a closed connection? Should it, is it just going to drop it? Yep. What does that kind of mean? Someone like a high level. Someone else is trying to. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be. It could be. It kind of just means we both sides have some kind of some
something bad has happened and we have desynchronized view, right? I thought you closed the connection and you still think that this connection is open. Or it could be a slow window or something. Uh, yeah, well, you could tell if it was in the window. Like, but if I tried to send additional data, like past, past, the window. past, past uh, yeah, exactly. Past this bin sequence number, basically. Um, yeah? Wouldn't both the client and server need to send each other thin packets? They don't have to, no. You can close one side of the connection and leave the other side open. So you only get data in one direction. Um, so this is where the reset packet comes in. Right? So if I were to get that, I would say, the server would say, uh, client, you said, told me you're not going to send any more data, which means something's really messed up. So it would send a reset packet to say, hey, we should reset this connection because something's going on. So it sends a reset, and then it goes back to the original state waiting for a connection. Is there a hand in the back? Can you send a data with a fin flag? I have to look. I think you, yes, you can, because I saw it when I was playing around with this. Um, yeah, it means that this is, you know, the fin is the sequence, like, this is the last data I'm going to send, so after this, there's no more. Cool. Okay, so we can look at this and see our original connection, right, from uh, .20 and .10. Right, so 22 sends a fin, and then dot 10 acknowledges that, so it acknowledges the sequence number here plus one. Um, and we can see here that it's sending zero data, and then the other side dot 10 sends a fin packet, and then we can see that the other side acknowledges it, and now we're done. Right, so this terminates uh, basically our four tuple, right? Our source, port, source, IP, destination, port, destination, IP. Right, so now we can make a new connection, and that's a brand new connection that's not related to this one. All right. So we want a port scan. We've talked about UDP port scans, right? We want to try to find out what services are living on a host, right? What ports are they listening to? Um, so we also want to do this in TCP. So how would we, what's the easy way to do this? Send 10 packets to C. Yeah. Send a send packet, get a send act packet, send an act back, act packet back, right? Um, and so we saw that there's services that are statically associated with port numbers, right? This is a convention, a standard. It doesn't have to be this way, uh, but it oftentimes is. So yeah, in this stupidest, simplest form of TCP port scanning, you try to connect to all 65,000 ports on the machine, right? If you get a valid connection, then you're good. Right, so we know if we did that three-step handshake with the sin, sin, act, act, right, then we know the connection is good. So, is this good? Yeah. Two questions, I guess. So one is, how many sockets can a port handle? How many OS dependent? It has nothing to do with the port on the server side because it's the four tuple. Right, so you you have the same uh, destination IP and the same port number, but as long as I, the source IP and the source port are different, you can have any combination of those. Okay. As many as the operating system will allow, basically. Second question? No, the answer's no. Okay. Two for one. Okay, so is this, I mean, is it good? Does it work? Is the first question. Will it work? Yeah, right? I mean, if we can do a three-way handshake, it means that something's listening there. There's something there that we can send data to on that port, right? So it definitely works. Um, what are some downsides? Is it perfect? How many packets are we going to send? Yeah, three times 65,000. Okay. Yeah, so UDP, right? We just sent packets, and we see, would see the we would get ICMP port not available <coughs> messages back for those ports that there was not services running on. Uh, but we weren't necessarily guaranteed to get a response back if it was there. Um, another advantage, so uh, we'll look at this a little bit more. So you don't need to be root, right? So any program can make a TCP connection to any port and any IP on another system, right? So doing this, you don't have to be root. You don't have to fiddle with any packets. You just ask the operating system, hey, connect to this IP and this port. 
And if it says connection successful, then you go, yes, awesome, I've port scanned this machine. Uh, the disadvantage, as we saw, right, it's very noisy, <laughs> right? You're sending full three-way handshakes um, all the time. So it's noisy on your end and on their end. Yes? Why do we need to send the slower technology in fast? Good question. We'll think about that as we <laughs> refine this some more. Yeah, so unlike UDP, we can play a lot of different games here. And we'll see, we can actually get it very uh, advanced, which is very cool. Um, is it because you tell the client what is the next expected packet number? Um, we'll see, we'll see, yeah. Uh, but basically, yes, that would be, if we could do it with less packets, then that's definitely gonna be better. Uh, but let's look at what this looks like. Uh, so you can use nmap to do this. I guess you don't have to be approved. Um, so you can nmap, and it will just try to, um, and you can see here that this version of nmap actually only does the top, you know, 15,000 ports that are used by TCP. Uh, there's a flag, I have no idea what it is, to change it to do all ports from 1 to 65,000. Um, and then so it shows you, it shows you, okay, on port 7, TCP, there's the echo service open, and it shows you the name of those services. And once again, right, the important thing to remember is all the information that this is giving you is I was able to connect to this IP on this port, right, successfully make a connection. And I know that that port number is associated with this service name. Right? It does not guarantee that that service is actually living there. Right? It's entirely possible to change port 22 and change it to a completely random port. Right? And then it will show up in the services as HTTP if it's port 80 or whatever it happens to be. So it's just important to keep this in mind that just because Nmap says that these things are there doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually running. Okay, yeah, so our refinement of this technique is, okay, instead of doing the whole handshake, let's just send a syn packet, right? And if we get a syn act back, then we know that, hey, this port, something is listening there, right? Because the server is trying to connect to us. It's not giving us a denied message. So we never have to send the finished, um, the finished act. And so this is called, for this reason, half open scanning because you're only halfway making, it's not actually halfway, it's like two steps of a three step process. Um, yeah, so if you send a SYN packet, if the server answers with a SYN act packet, then the port's open. Uh, if it sends a reset packet or you get no response back, then it means that that port is closed. Um, and then the attacker can send a reset packet instead of a, the final act, so that that way the operating system on the other end just terminates the connection. So this is actually an important point to note at the bottom here. This obviously depends on the operating system and the versions and everything like that, but um, this could be something that's handled by deep you know, networking IP layer code that says, hey, when I get a SYN packet, I send a SYN act, and then if I get a reset, I just stop, right? I, I kill that connection. Uh, but it's not actually logged anywhere that somebody tried to connect to this port, right? Unless you have additional logging features. Um, so we can look at what this looks like. Now for this, you do need to be root to do this, right? Because you need to actually create packets and only do half of the connection, right? So Linux doesn't allow you that level of packet granularity by default to any application. But using like libnet or scappy, you can easily do this, which is how nmap does it. Um, so I would say, okay, these are the ports that I found was, was open, and we can look and see that, okay, it's sending from .69 to .38. Uh, it sends a packet to port 78, and there should be like dots above here because there's a lot of stuff that's happening. Um, then it sends a sin packet to Maybe it doubles it for some reason? I actually don't know. That seems, I think it maybe a copy past that error. Okay. Uh, port 82, port 80, port 79. So we get a reset packet back from port 78. So we know 78's not open. Uh, 81 is not open, 82 is not open. And we get a sin back from port 80. So we know, good, that's up. Uh, and then we send a reset back to port 80 so that, that way it terminates the connection, doesn't keep anything open, and we just continue going about our business. 
and it would acknowledge, uh, does it acknowledge our reset? No, that's a reset from 79. See, are these in order? 78, 81, 82, again. Some more questions on this? All right, so this is our attempt to uh, essentially use the knowledge of the TCP stack and how it works, right, in order to scan, because what's the bit or I guess 65,000 bits of information we're trying to get. Those results tell us one bit of information. What's that bit of information? What's that? Port 80 is open on that IP. Right? That's that one bit of information. When we're doing these scans, we want to find out for all ports, right? So 65,000. So I just think of it like it's one bit of information. Is it open or closed? Right? And one way is try to connect, right? But by using our knowledge of the TCP stack, right, which is something you guys identified right away, it's like, yeah, why do this whole three-way handshake? We can actually get that bit of knowledge earlier in that handshake between sending the SYN and then if I get a SYN act back, now I have that bit of information. I don't have to complete the connection, right? So that's what kind of all these techniques are about, is how can I extract that one bit of information that this port is open or closed based on my knowledge of networking and that kind of stuff. Isn't it locked somewhere, like in product logs, if you like enable logging, so you can see? It depends on the system. I can't get into the particulars. Um, you could kind of see that, like, yeah, it would be clearly you'd want to log all fully established connections, but for every reason, maybe you don't log every single error case, right, and every single reset packet. Um, so that's kind of what this technique takes advantage of. Um, I still think even with this and sending the reset, I think it uses less packets per port, right, because it's per open port. Yeah? Uh, why do we need the root to do the same scan? Because the operating system the abstractions that it gives us to operate with IP and port only allows us to say connect to this IP and this port. Yeah. Right? I this think the higher ports are allowed, the lower ports. Well, that's for listening, okay. not for connecting though. Okay. Um, for connecting everything. Yeah, you can connect to whatever port on any other machine. But so the operating system abstracts all these details from you, right? So you only get a response back when you've done the sin, sin act act. Right? And then you get a good, that packet, that socket is good, now we can use this to communicate. Right? But it doesn't give you any of this. You don't have the ability to say, mm, only send the first two packets, but when you get the third one back, send a reset packet. Uh, so that's why you have to manually craft these packets. Because the TCP implementation doesn't give you that, that type of abstraction. Cool. Okay, so there's other cool ways to do this, and we're gonna go through them. So. Uh, one way is fin scanning. So what does this sound like it means? It does a full TCP connection and then closes it. Just Not quite. Like which goes to the light. So it actually, so sin scanning, right? Use the sin packet, do sin, sin, act, act, right? For full connect scanning. Um, this is, we're gonna try sending a fin packet to that port. So why might this be interesting? How does that, how could this give us that bit of information? Fin acknowledgement. What? Fin acknowledgement. An acknowledgement? This is actually, we're not even gonna establish a connection. Yeah. Right? So, now we're kind of diving into levels. So if you think about it, at a high level, right, the connect scanning, that actually uh, takes advantage of the protocol level, right? The protocol says if you get a SYN and you're listening on that port, you need to send back a SYN ACK, and then you send back an ACK, right? Both of those two, uh, the half open and the fully SYN scan, right? They take advantage of the protocol, right? But now to be a little sneak here, we can try to take advantage of different implementations. What do they do in error cases, right? Does their response, when I do something that's not in the spec, does it allow me to get that bit of information that it's listening or not listening? Right? So here, in a lot of TCP IP stacks, 
If the port is closed, when they get a fin packet, a reset packet is sent back. That says, hey, we have to reset, something's wrong. But if the port is open, the fin packet is ignored. Right? So now we have a way to distinguish between these two cases, right? We can extract our one bit of information just by sending fin packets. Um, of course, this doesn't work in all cases, right? So on some versions of Windows, a reset packet is sent either way. So it doesn't actually work for, uh, for all TCP stacks. Um, but if you know you're targeting a Linux machine, right? Or a Unix machine, you can use these techniques. Um, so, and there's, this is kind of like a general concept of, it's actually applied a lot in security. So basically, can I fingerprint or can I get some information, extract some information based on variations in an implementation, right? Does the implementation change its external behavior based on the condition that I'm interested in, right? This case, port listening and what happens when I send a fin packet. Specifically, what happens if I just like, what if I set all the bits in the flags? What if I set the fin packet, the push packet, and the urgent packet? Right? Why is it called a Christmas tree? Or Xmas packet? <laughs> like everything's all lit up like a Christmas tree. All ones. Right? So what does it do? What is this? I, I don't I believe the spec has no say of, of exactly what should happen in this case, right? So that means implementations are free to do it differently. And if they respond differently depending on the, uh, the status of the port, now then we have a way to detect. Same thing with null, what if we set no flags? All flags is zero, right? How does the implementation respond? Um, so we can look at this, you can do this, nmap supports all these kinds of things, it has tons of options, you can look at this, so you can say, okay, uh, scan for using fin scanning, um, so in this case, it's going to send a fin packet to port 79, 82, 81, 80, 78, and to get back, it gets the, it gets back a reset from 79, 82, 81, 78, and it gets back. Uh, so we know from the timeout here, we didn't get a reset from port 80, but we've inferred that port 80 is open, right? So just like relying on any kind of timeout-based technique, it could be that that packet just got lost. Right, just like with UDP. So uh, we should probably do some other steps then to verify that this was the case. Any questions on this? So it's kind of a general idea in um, this. Actually, this concept applies in a lot of different places in computer in uh, security. So for instance, um, doing in areas you wouldn't even expect, like fingerprinting browsers. Right, so oftentimes advertisers want to try to fingerprint your browser to link your profile and your browsing habits with other different users and different sites. So to do this, they'll use features of your browser, like what fonts are installed and what, um, what functions are available, like what exact version of your browser are you using, what, ex um, what fonts are installed, what extensions are installed, and those few bits of information are enough to uniquely identify you. Um, so this is kind of the same idea, just in a different, Context. Yeah. Can I say that fin scanning is not accurate? Because if I'm in a network that is busy and it drops a lot of packets, so most of my packets are stopped. Yeah. And they will get found. Yeah, so the other ways, right, we're more reliable. Like especially connect scanning, right? I know three way handshake, right? Um, but whereas in this, yeah, exactly. If the packet gets dropped or something happens to the network, then yeah, so you, maybe you take an additional step then afterwards to verify. But you're sending an awful lot less traffic, right? So it's good as an advertiser. Yeah. Oh, should sorry. Be faster, I guess. Uh, yeah, it should be. Well, it depends on the timeout, right? If you got a timeout, you don't want to overload the network, so I can't definitively say. Yeah. Could do a hybrid approach where if you don't get a response back in a certain period, then you send the same. Yeah. Hey, you could do a hybrid approach, right? You just kind of use this list to build and do some reconnaissance of what services are listening on that machine. Um, that information on its own isn't that interesting, right? An attacker will try to leverage that information by trying to connect to those services to do something. So yeah, eventually you're gonna wanna verify. So, if we think about this from the defender's perspective, what's kind of the downside to the attacker for all three of these, like, or all of these port scanning techniques? Slow, 
they're not actually that slow. <laughs> it depends, but yeah. You need root access for some? Yeah, but that doesn't have anything to do with the defender. It's not leverage. It's not leverage in what sense? That's true. So we're not, we probably can't use this for any kind of denial of service attack, right? Because denial of service, we need some kind of leverage. Um, what was, uh, let's see. What were some of the things we could use ICMP packets for, like Smurf, a Smurf attack? Why could we do those things? Because what? We didn't need a response. We didn't need a response. Why didn't we need a response? What did that allow us to do? Spoof the source IP address, right? Can we do that with these techniques? Can we spoof the IP address for SIN scanning? Or connect scanning? Sorry. Hmm? No, why not? So can we spoof, let's think about this one, right? This three step process, can I spoof the, uh, the source IP of the SYN packet. Yes, right, just an IP packet, I can spoof that. But when the server replies, who are they gonna send that reply to? Yes, that other person that we, we um, replied to, or we spoofed, right? But in order to successfully complete that connection, we need to send an acknowledgement of whatever that sequence number that went to another machine that we don't control, right? So we'll actually get into how we can, well, can we do that? But for connect, right? We need to send a packet and we need that packet to come back to us so we can see what happened, right? So in all three of these cases for connect scanning and SYN scanning and FIN scanning, right? We need the responses back to us so we can't spoof where this comes from. Well, is that good as an attacker? No, we can't hide ourselves, right? With a Smurf attack, we can actually hide that it was us doing it, right? Which makes it, I'll say two things, way cooler and also more dangerous, right? Um, and more impactful. So there's actually other ways that are stealthier to do this port scanning that don't actually come from you, but that are, can be less reliable, right? So we trade off kind of reliability for stealthiness. Uh, this is what's called idle scanning. So it's a little bit complicated, but it's really interesting. So the idea is um, we're going to, yeah? This might be unrelated, but NMAP has a spoof option too. Do you know what that does? Uh, I'm ahead, no. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. All right. <laughs> I mean, so, okay, when I say that you can't spoof, right? If you spoof a host on your local network, that doesn't exist, then you can use like ARP poisoning to pretend that it came from a different IP address on your local subnet. Because you'll still get those packets coming back. Um, so you can change the, you can change that, you can spoof the MAC address too. Um, but doing like something really interesting, like pretending to be a computer in a completely other network, you just can't do. Yeah. For most attacks. Okay, so the idea is we're gonna use a victim host to basically relay our scan. So we're going to try to use this host to extract that one bit of information from a different, from our actual victim host. So we use this host essentially as a relay. So the basic idea is, the where idle comes from here, is we want a machine that's not generating a lot of traffic. We want a machine that's essentially idle, that's doing basically nothing, our relay. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna send a vic our victim that we wanna scan, we're gonna send them a SYN packet spoofed from the source IP of our relay. And what we'll see is that by, so it seems that packets are coming from the victim, right, or from <sighs> the victim relay and the target, these are confusing. Uh, it seems like the packets are coming from the relay and so the target will then reply to the vic apply to our relay. So if the port is open, right, we expect the, the target that we're trying to scan to send back a SYNAC, 
right? And if that happens, then the victim said, hey, I never sent you a sin packet. We should reset this connection because you're, you're going crazy. There's no, I've never sent you a sin packet. But if the target replies with a reset, of the, uh, so if the port is closed, right, and our target sends a reset packet, then our relay doesn't send out any packets at all. So we can actually leverage the fact that in most TCP IP implementations, the ID datagram, the IP datagram, right, has an ID field. What was that field used for? Why do we want to identify packets at the IP level? Fragmentation. Yeah, when we fragment packets, we know that they come from the same, the same original packet. So what I can do as an attacker, I can first send a packet to the, to the relay, see what ID number it is, then I send this packet spoofed as if it's coming from the relay. This behavior here will conditionally change the ID of the IP diagram, and then I send another packet to the relay, and it will respond back with a different <coughs> ID depending on if this was successful or not. So the idea is if I know that this Datagram has increased, then I know that the port on the target machine is actually open. Otherwise, if it's not increased, then I know that port has is closed. So I'm essentially inferring the state of this port on a third machine being open or not, depending on if the ID uh, field of an IP packet changes on my relay machine. And I can do that because this machine is idle and it's not servicing requests, right? Because I'm essentially trying to see if it does this one, if it increases based on one packet getting sent back. So questions on this at a high level, and then we'll kind of step through this, so hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. Is this not really cool? I think this is really cool. It's like super cool. You're like tricking another machine into scanning a third machine. Okay. So first step we have to do is the attacker needs to determine what's the initial IP ID. That's sequence number should be ID. Right, so we have our relay, we have the victim, and we have the attacker. Right, so the attacker is gonna send a packet to the relay, says hey, this is from attacker, right? We can't spoof our address because we need the response back. You say, hey, this is an attack, this is, obviously would be, you wouldn't say I'm attacker, right? You'd say, <laughs> from IP address me uh, to IP address you of the relay. Uh, ID, whatever, ID doesn't matter, to some port, a SYNAC or something, and then it sends us a reset packet back, and this has an IP datagram ID of 1234, which makes it very easy to remember, right? So now I know, 1234. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, the attacker is then gonna spoof a SYN packet as if it came from the relay to the victim. All right, so the victim's gonna get this uh, for port 80, because I wanna see if port 80 is open. And then when the victim gets this, what's it gonna do if port 80 is open? SYN act to who? The victim, right? Not to us, not to the attacker. We don't get that, right? So it responds back and says, hey, Thank you for your connection attempt. Uh, here's the second step of the two-way handshake. And then what does the relay see, right? The relay didn't see this top packet at all, right? It has no idea about this. So it's just getting a SYNAC packet from a random machine, right? So it's like, uh, what are you doing, crazy? Stop talking to me. Uh, and then the reset. But look at what happened to the ID number here, right? Got incremented to one, one, two, three, five from one, two, three, four, which we originally had when we talked to the machine. So now I do the same thing. Now I've done this, so now I want to determine the relay's final IP ID. So I'd send another uh, packet, like a SYNAC or whatever, and it would send me a reset. And so I see it's one, two, three, six, right? So it incremented two from when I originally sent that packet. Right, so then what about the case where I send a spoof connection and it's a closed port, port 80 is closed. Is the victim gonna send a SYNAC? No, it can't, right? 
It's either going to send nothing, right, which we saw could be the case on some systems, um, or it's going to send a reset packet and say, right, this is not good. And then the relay, when it gets a reset packet for something, it has no idea. Uh, so if you think about it, right, if I say, hey, our connection's messed up, here's a reset, and you get that, and you're like, I'm not expecting a reset, here's a reset, your packet's messed up. We would just keep <laughs> sending back resets forever, right? So this is why the relay shouldn't re reply to a reset, right? It should just either ignore it or not do any behavior here, right? So now what's the next IP packet that relay is going to send? What's its IP going to be? One, two, three, five, right? We got one, two, three, four first. This didn't generate any packet from relay. So the next packet's gonna be one, two, three, five. So now we can uh, make that connection and see that the packet back is one, two, three, five. All right, so now we've used this, that difference of that ID field to try to get that one bit of information of is port 80 open on a completely different machine and victim only ever sees IP traffic from the relay and only talks to the relay, right? It doesn't even know we exist, it doesn't know our IP address, it has knows nothing about us. And if relay is a machine that's idle and it's not being used at all, then I doubt they're doing any logging of who's sending packets to them. Questions on this? Yeah? Doesn't this have to be really synchronized? I mean, um, yes and no. So. If you want to precisely determine based on one of this, uh, yes. But the nice thing is you could do like a, you could do this multiple times, right? <laughs> and do kind of like a statistical analysis and say, okay, is it likely that this port is open or not, right? And the more times you do it, the more times you'll be able to tell. Yeah. How long would the attacker need to wait until sending another packet to the relay? Yeah. It's tough. I don't know. Right? I mean, there's no one good answer, right? Because you also have to, yeah, you have to send, spoof that packet. It could be that victim has a policy where it doesn't send any packets back to Relay's IP address, right? So you could have to try different relays. Uh, that's why you're trading off here reliability versus stealthiness. Uh, because you have to rely on this completely third-party machine that you have no control over. So packets could get lost accidentally, right, in the network. You would never know about it, all that kind of stuff. It could be that victim never... And you don't know if it's, uh, did this IP number not increase because victim never got your original packet? Or did the response from victim to relay get dropped? Uh, any number of things could have possibly happened, so. But, you know, you can, you do it enough times and you can kind of, you're reasonably, I mean, not assured, but you have some idea, yeah. Yeah, follow up, uh, how do we first determine whether our, our system could we use as a relay system or not? Mm. Like, do we How need we to do know? That? How can we do that? What was it? Sniffing. Sniffing. Uh, let's say they're all on completely different networks. Oh. We can just stretching? We can just uh, take a time frame and try doing that IP datagram if there is any difference. Yeah, right? So we're already relying on the fact that the IP datagram is essentially it doesn't have to be monotonically increasing, but is increasing based on the traffic, right? So we could send these packets and try to send these packets to relay and see how that number is changing, right? If that number is changing not very much at all, then we can say, yes, it's probably idle. If we know something about this server, like it's located in the US and it's used for, I don't know, ASU's, mm, I should say that, a random company's payroll or something, Right, we can say, okay, it's probably highly unlikely that this is gonna happen at like Sunday at 3 a.m. Right, and so we could do that then. Um, yeah. Yeah, one more question. Like, uh, we are looking at the ID number over here, but this won't be much, this technique would be much reliable because uh, the relay can be talking to many other yeah, hosts also. So my exactly. ID number can change to a high extent and so that's why we have the idle. So that's one of the keys of this technique is you choose a relay that is idle and is not making a lot of connections. Exactly. Oh no, we're done. Ah, okay. I really want to get done with this. Okay. We have, all right, we'll be definitely be able to finish all, finish all this on Monday. I'm probably gonna cut some stuff. But we'll, we'll finish networking on Monday.